Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. I wish to welcome each of you to a special program of the North Idaho College Public Forum. We've been asked to put together this one-hour special and to deal with what uh, our people believe is a terribly important topic. Our topic for the next hour on this special is entitled Religion and Politics on the Horn of a Dilemma. This particular issue has been with us in our country since its founding and has found its way into the Constitution very early in our history. But it's come to our attention in a much more magnified way in the last two or three years, particularly in 1984, when there's been a very serious debate in this country as to the role of religion and the role of government and their relationship to one another. And as our title indicates, for many people in this country of various schools of thought, it has become rather a dilemma of where religion should stop and where the state uh, should act or vice versa. In order to deal with that, I would like to bring to your attention, first of all, that the Constitution of the United States and the First Amendment, and through court decisions and application into the 14th Amendment, the Constitution says, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In order to maintain those two principles that are found in the Constitution, we often debate what it involves to allow individuals in society to participate in decision-making of government and at the same time not interfere with the religious exercise that each individual has a right to and at the same time not have the type of interference from government that would infringe upon that are the rights or views of other people. As we live in a pluralistic society, it is quite often that we find ourselves disagreeing on the interpretation of this amendment or its application in society. On this program today, we are very fortunate to have four guests who have consented to take their time and have done their research to be with us to discuss what I believe to be one of the significant issues of our times. I will introduce each of these people separately at different times through the program and they will each give their different uh, viewpoints concerning this important topic. I would like to suggest that we start with the first school of thought, what I would describe in the terms the traditionalist uh, interpretation of the separation of church and state. This traditionalist approach I would describe as somewhat separatist, believing that the role of religion should be very divorced from public policy and government decisions. If I am interpreting that position improperly for our guest, I am sure that he will correct me as to his position. Our first guest is Dr. Charles, uh, Charles Glock, who is a retired professor of sociology, and he taught at the University of California in Berkeley. He has made a number of appearances in which he has been willing to discuss this very important topic, and I'm going to ask him uh, today to give us his position and to explain to you why he believes that the traditionalist approach should be interpreted and maintained by the court and others in the Constitution. Dr. Glock, as I approach this school of thought with you, may I quote uh, an individual who I think has somewhat had this position, a Reverend Charles Bergstrom, who is of the Lutheran Council of the United States. He said in discussing this subject one time, and I quote, Whatever form it takes, proselytizing or evangelizing for a particular belief system in the realm of education is foreign to the teachings of Christ." End of quote. From he and others, such as Senator Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, they've indicated that they feel that there has been an encroachment upon that separation as found in the Constitution. I would at this time like to invite you to take a few minutes to uh, comment upon this approach and also the position that you hold. Well, I'd like to begin by <clears throat> making a distinction between the church being involved in politics and religious people being involved in politics. Uh, I would like to argue against the church being involved in politics. I think the church should stick to religion and stay out of politics. On the other hand, I don't see how it's possible for religious people to somehow stay out of politics because politics essentially is making judgments about the kinds of social arrangements that we want to live with and religious people as well as non-religious people are going to try to inform that process. 
Um, but turning to the first position, namely that the position that the church should stick to religion and stay out of politics, uh, this is a complicated topic and hard to deal with very briefly, but let me make a few points. If one looks historically at ways in which churches have involved themselves in politics, the record, it strikes me, is almost consistently grim. One way that the church can involve itself in politics is to try to take complete control. Uh, we call states in which religion is in control theocracies. Uh, the most widely known current theocracy is in Iran. I don't know that I have to say very much about that society to uh, suggest the kind of oppression which goes with theocracies. If one looks historically at theocracies, uh, consistently those who are not a true believers are oppressed. A true belief in where it has power tends inevitably to be oppressive. Fortunately, in the United States, we have not had a theocracy, although we, we have some examples of some, in a way. Uh, there is a movement now of a small kind which is trying to establish a theocracy inside one of our states. But more often, uh, politi church is enter into politics in the United States not by taking control of the country, but by trying to influence legislation. The most famous example of where the churches have been successful uh, in this regard was in the passage of the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which was the amendment uh, prohibiting the sale, transportation, and manufacture of alcohol. This was a very divisive period during our, our history. In the end, we uh, amended that amendment and abandoned it. Uh, but during it, we had all sorts of negative things happening. Crime was widespread. Religious people were opposed to other religious people. Recently, I would say we've had an example of religion, of the churches having an influence on politics and the passage of the recent legislation which is going to allow religious groups to organize into school, in school situations. Uh, keep your eyes open. That will be a long-term controversial uh, decision, and we will have more pain than rewards from it. A third way that churches enter into politics is by passing at their conventions uh, partisan po political positions. Virtually all denominations do this. Usually the, the position is acted on by vote, and whether it's 52 to 48 or 98 to 2, uh, the position is somehow identified as a Christian position. The problem here, I think, is that it is more harmful to the churches, perhaps, than to the society more generally. But clearly, one of the serious problems in American churches today is the difficulty surrounding the kinds of partisan statements which the National Council of Churches has taken and which individual denominations take. And the reason it causes so much trouble is that m many Christians or Jews uh, object to the position which their churches take and do not agree that it is the Christian position. Unfortunately, the Bible and scriptures are not so clear as to what the religious position on most issues is. The matter is also joined at the local congregation when the pastor decides that he is going to speak uh, particularly from the pulpit on partisan politics. Again, the problem has to do with the divisiveness which is gen engendered, and in a sense, this is a matter of fair play involved. If my pastor takes a strong position on abortion one way or the other, and I, through thinking through my faith in some detail, come to a different position, it seems to me that some resentment that he presents himself by virtue of being the pastor as speaking for the church, uh, that this is not exactly conducive to creating harmony, nor to producing effectiveness. I think the record is that the churches, when they have engaged in politics as institutions, have tended to be oppressive, have tended to be divisive, and by and large have not been very effective. Now what, for a moment, 
Do I have a moment? Just about another minute, please. <clears throat> As regards individual Christians and Jews entering into politics, I don't see how it's possible that they can escape it. However, it seems to me that they can do it as individuals rather than as representing themselves as having exclusive grasp of any religious position. I favor Christians acting as individuals. I also have uh, no objections to their joining groups which, which, with which to foster positions. I do object, as in the case of the moral majority, when the name that the group adopts it is one which again creates hostility. Someone, somehow one assumes that moral uh, means that if you do not belong to that group you're immoral. The word majority suggests that somehow if you don't belong to that group you're in the minority. Dr. Glock, with that I'm afraid and I'm going to have to interrupt and we'll be back to you okay. and, and deal with some of those points. Ladies and gentlemen, a second uh, school of thought or viewpoint uh, it's been often described in uh, recent days as the new religious right, and although certainly it is traditional in the sense that some of the issues have been around a long time, we often call this too uh, the more fundamentalist approach to theology and the role of, of the state and religion. The person probably best known for this position is Dr. Jerry Falwell, who has also headed the moral majority. This group is also often described as uh, participating in what is called the social conservative agenda of the 1980s. They have in the past proposed to ban abortion, uh, to return prayers to the public schools in the United States, and for example, to, to provide federal tax credits to parents with children who attend private religious institutions. Uh, they promote uh, legislation that meets the viewpoints that they hold. President Ronald Reagan, who has been supportive oftentimes of many leaders of this movement, has said recently, and I quote, America has begun a spiritual reawakening. Faith and hope are being restored. Americans are returning to God, end of quote. Another person in the political arena who is very supportive of the uh, more fundamental approach to the question of religion in the state is Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina. And he once said, and I am quoting, if we do it, speaking of the prayer amendment to the Constitution, it is likely that not only will the children be closer to God, but that we, including the Supreme Court, will be drawn closer as well, end of quote. I'm happy to welcome to the program today uh, Reverend John Green, who is a minister of evangelism at the Falls Christian Academy uh, in uh, Post Falls, Idaho. Uh, Reverend Green has continued to come to give his position, which, uh, again, as I said to the last speaker, if I have uh, placed you in a position that's not exactly as uh, indicated, uh, please feel free to state clearly for us uh, your position, and we would invite you to take the next five minutes to express your viewpoint. Okay, I think um, the position that I've been attributed to is near enough to what I can offer uh, to share with. Uh, I too believe that there is a need for <coughs> separation of church and state and according to the First Amendment there we have a uh, a law that's been legislated for us on the Constitution as a protection and I would adhere to this and believe that that is true, but it's, all, it's a two-sided uh, law. One is that it, it uh, denies the uh, power of a church to uh, come in with their domination into the public or you and I. And on the other side, it also gives us a liberty to uh, express ourselves in the religious capacities that we have. Uh, I think if we were to understand first the real uh, definition of church, religion, and politics, that it might give us some kind of an avenue to, to go by uh, to realize what issues we're, we're making when we say that we want to separate either church and state or religion and state. Let me just quote a, uh, out of the Webster's Dictionary. This is the definition of religion. It says, belief in a divine or superhuman power to be obeyed as the creator and ruler of the universe. Expression to include this, expression of such a belief in conduct and ritual. Uh, secondly, any specific system of belief, worship, or conduct. This is the dictionaries, Webster's definition of religion. The Bible's uh, 
definition of religion is this. In James chapter 1 verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Webster's definition of political is this, of or concerned with government, the state or politics. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, uh, quote, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And another is of the increase of his government, referring to Christ, and peace there shall be no end. So with these definitions in mind, I think that that maybe we could lessen the conflict of church and state or religion and state if we were to literally understand the meaning of pure religion, undefiled. I would think that those that would oppose uh, influence of religion or, or church, but specifically a, a religion, would not oppose the fact that it's good to be a good person and to, to do the things that the scripture defines as being pure. And secondly, that the government, if the scriptures are, are truly the inerrant word of God, which my stand would be that I'm accepting them as the absolute authority of God, it, it clearly states that the government is upon his shoulders, and of his government there shall be no end, as we read in Isaiah. And I would say to even attempt for man, as frail as man is, to to somehow separate thinking he has the ability to separate church or religion and state is just a misnomer to, to begin with. It's, it's uh, almost unbelievable that man could be so high-minded and haughty to believe that he was able to remove God from God's own creation because God himself declared himself as sovereign. He said, I am over all, above all, all things are made by me and for me. And therefore, to, to it's, it reminds me of an ant, uh, in, in, to, to build an ant hill, and in the middle of where he wants to build the ant hill is this 10-ton rock. And the ant is so, so uh, you know, bent on building the ant hill right there that he at, maybe at first tries to move the rock and fails to do it. And so then, in his attempt to to do something about the rock, he would either ignore it or call it something else that it isn't. And I think that, that in man's struggle to remove God from uh, every realm of life, and this being the political and the religious uh, separation, that, that man has done the same thing that the ant has done. He's seen there is a rock, the solid rock, as we declare Jesus Christ, and man has chosen to either ignore him and say, we don't recognize you as the sovereign God of this government, even though you said it was upon your shoulders. We don't believe that. And or we've renamed the solid rock something else and said, we'll handle it with either humanism or some other form of intellectualism. And I think the, the frustration then has come to man because of the unawareness of who God really is. And I believe that God is interested to keep his sovereignty uh, first in our minds to know that he is Lord of the government. He is Lord of the political arena. And our attempt to separate him is just futility. Thank you, Reverend Green. We'll be back and we'll pursue this further. Ladies and gentlemen, our third uh, school of thought that we would like to pursue comes from the what one could describe as the liberal uh, theology or interpretation. It too has had a long history. We have had in the past such well-known religious leaders as the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was uh, a Baptist minister, also very involved in the political process. We have had others. Uh, we've had priests dealing with uh, issues of peace and war. We've had Andrew Young, who's also a Baptist minister, who was in the Congress and also was ambassador of the United Nations, and he took his liberal theology into the political arena. We have also had, uh, in recent times, uh, a religious leader by the name of uh, Jesse Jackson, who even ran for President of the United States. Our next guest today is Reverend Richard Hermstead of the Trinity Lutheran Church in Coeur Idaho. 
And Reverend Hermstead is uh, very involved not only as a religious leader, but in a number of issues that are public in nature. Those who particularly come from this viewpoint oftentimes emphasize uh, civil rights legislation and civil rights questions and equality. They're also very involved in foreign policy issues such as the peace question and also the nuclear issue. I would like at this time to invite Reverend Hermstead as I have our other guests to uh, give us his dissertation on this approach to the question of religion and the state. Thank you, Tony. I, uh, I want to comment first of all on the, uh, on the liberal. I guess I'm not I don't usually view myself as liberal. You said progressive, and that perhaps is a more comfortable term. I guess I often see myself as a radical conservative. Uh, and um, that, while I won't discuss that, that means I try and take the biblical message seriously and live with it in the world. I think one thing is clear from the present discussion regarding churches and their involvement with the political process, and that is that it's not a matter of whether or not people should be involved or churches should be involved, but how that involvement might best happen. The clear, clear indication is that we are, in fact, involved. And uh, both, both liberal and conservative factions would like their agendas attended to, and, and uh, for some factions they have little regard for the views of the opposition, which is too bad. There are, however, two extremes which I think need to be avoided. One is the domination of the state by the church. Charles mentioned uh, theocracy um, as one expression of that. In our own history in the nation, we have a kind of religious perversion that was involved with the New England colonies and the events that led to things like the Salem witch trials, um, where a particular religious persuasion became dominant. The other extreme is exclusion from the political process. It can happen in two forms, at least. One is an exclusion that's insisted upon by the power of the state, and that's the kind of thing at which we cringe relative the, to the communist philosophy. But another is exclusion due to a religious quietism which insists that uh, as Christians or as people in the church, as uh, part of our faith, we really have not much of anything to do with life in the world. Um, to quote James again, we, we take that word to say we're to remain unspotted, which means we don't touch it. Um, but Jesus said we are in but not of the world, and I think that's a little different perspective. Um, it's my understanding of the Constitution and the Jeffersonian position that both are to be avoided in our, in our own form of government. The, uh, the Constitution guarantees free speech so that the voices of the people can be heard, including that of religious people, since they are indeed a part of, a part of the community which we know as the United States. A separation of church and state is not in principle for the pe keeping silent of the voice of the church so much as it is an attempt to prevent the, the church to dominate the society um, or for a particular religious persuasion to dominate that society. As a part of that society, our voice is not meant to be muffled. One of the questions that comes into play is, is what is, what is faith? Um, Martin Marty wrote a book called The Public Church in which he contends that we have for a long time held a kind of a public piety in which we try and express the results of our faith in public and it takes particular forms usually in terms of moral absolutes um, but that we've kept our faith rather private and we haven't let the faith that we hold contribute to the discussion. He contends that we need to switch from a, from a public piety and private faith to a public faith and a private piety whereby we, uh, we add to the discussion in the nation as a whole the voice of, of those people who grow from a religious tradition and hold a particular kind of faith. So the question is, how shall we be involved, not whether? Um, and it's the variety of responses to that particular kind of question that really sparks a lot of the debate that's going on in Time and Newsweek and uh, at prayer breakfasts and the like. Let me just note, uh, several ways that the church does participate in public. First of all, uh, preaching is a public event. It's open to any and all, and while not any and all, uh, not all come, uh, it is indeed a public activity. And there the attempt is to preach the word of God as we understand it in such a way that it, uh, it helps to illuminate or to shape or to uh, give some sense of purpose and direction to the lives of the people who hear. Um, 
while I agree with Dr. Glock that probably preaching partisan politics and, and uh, campaigning for particular candidates is out of place in the pulpit, I don't think that should eliminate speaking to the issues involved in the political arena. The goal is to help or even pressure people to face the issues that, uh, that their faith brings to their life in the world at large. It really grows out of the prophetic tradition of the scriptures. Second is convention action. That's primarily an education function, although sometimes it also speaks to the leaders in public life. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. It's meant to suggest, not to demand. A third way is advocacy relative to the larger issues, concerns for justice, injustice, voiceless, powerless people in the society. And again, the goal is the common good as it is approached by our life of faith. A fourth thing that is important to remember is that the church always addresses the public in a servant role and not in that of a master. Our, our action, which takes place on a voluntary basis, is to move toward resolving some of the crises that are oppressing people. Things such as hunger, civil rights, uh, various forms of oppression are those kinds of issues where the church most often speaks. The assumption that I make is that we are always at risk in so doing that, uh, that we are vulnerable, we are weak, and we speak only from what we see to be our own tradition and view, but that we feel because of our faith that that's a view worth speaking about. The goal is to contribute to the public policy debate in a voice that is as civil as possible. We're to do our, our homework as well as we can, and uh, we're to speak with as, as civil a tongue in that civil debate as is possible. With that, I will also indicate we'll come back and we'll pursue that further. Ladies and gentlemen, as one views these different approaches to politics and religion, one also discovers that the Supreme Court finds itself in the middle of the issue. As people in society disagree, they often uh, dispute over what should be policy and what the role is of separation of church and state. And when those uh, public policies are made, others will engage in litigation. Oftentimes the court has to make a decision and they have done so many times, but particularly since the 1960s with a number of very uh, well-known and, and celebrated cases in the 1960s such as Abington, Murray, and the Vital cases in which they talked about such things as Bible reading and prayers in schools. Uh, since then, in the 1980s in particular, they've been also addressing a number of other questions in relation to nativity scenes that, at uh, city halls and so forth. They've also talked about the issues of, uh, uh, in st at the state level of income tax deductions for tuition and textbooks in schools. In dealing with this, the justices, like our guest today, do not agree. Uh, first of all, uh, former Justice Potter Stewart once said concerning this issue about politics and state, and I'm quoting, I cannot see how an official religion is established by letting those who want to say a prayer say it. He also quoted from a particular court case when he said, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being, end of quote. Justice Hugo Black, who also served on the court with distinction for a number of years, also addressed this question and disagreed uh, with the distinguished Justice Stewart. He said, and I am quoting, state help to religion injects political and party prejudices into a holy field. It's too it too often substitutes force for prayer, hate for love, and persecution for persuasion. Government should not be allowed under the cover of the soft euphemism of cooperation to steal into the sacred arena of religious choice." End of quote. We're very fortunate to have today with us a gentleman who has the academic background and the expertise to discuss the role of the court in dealing with this very important issue. I would welcome to the program Professor Jim Vache from Gonzaga University's School of Law. His area of specialty is public law uh, constitutional administrative law. Uh, professor, I would like to invite you to take the, a short period of time to tell us what the court has said and also for you to indicate where you think it's going in this dispute over politics and religion. Well, thank you, Tony. <coughs> With the brief amount of time I have, I obviously can't cover that entire topic, but we'll make a stab at it. I think that my colleagues that have spoken so far demonstrate some of the problems that we have to look at when we talk about the court uh, making decisions in, in the area of religion and politics. Ultimately, it's a social issue, certainly, that we have disputes about the meaning of the Constitution, but more profoundly about problems in our society. 
And any time we have those kinds of disputes, when we have three representative views here today, as good Americans, what we always do is trot off to court to try and get it resolved so that the court becomes a social policy maker. Uh, the anomaly here is that the politicians and the political life is unsettled enough that it has to find some means of putting into repose a dispute. And what our system does is look primarily to the courts and to the United States Supreme Court. When it does that, the difficulty that then comes up is that the court has to face an issue. It can't face a political question, but an issue in a particular case. And it, in dealing with religion, it deals with, as in any other case, with a case passively brought to it. That is, it sits and waits for a case to come along and must decide it. It decides an individual case, but at the same time, the court is certainly aware that it's making policy in a very pluralistic society. Uh, knowing that it's not an elected body, it must yet make decisions on these volatile issues and on very narrow questions that are presented to it. That's a distinction that some people overlook sometimes. It's easy for a presidential candidate to debate an issue generally. The courts are faced with having to decide those kinds of issues in particular cases, and that changes the nature of the discussion. In dealing with religion issues, the court has faced for a number of years, and I would correct you, not correct you, I'd suggest that the religion issue has come up many times prior to the 60s and the 40s. There were a series of cases and also in the late 19th century the Mormons presented a good number of cases to the United States Supreme Court. But generally I think it's been the 60s, 70s, and 80s when we faced the issue. In any event, the court in deciding those kinds of cases must recognize that it's dealing with a volatile issue and very often with a public that absorbs the cases that's single issue oriented. And so it's aware of the fact that it generates enormous debate in our society. And I think sometimes it perhaps deliberately generates that debate to try and get the political process to solve an issue. In looking at the question, it must use two clauses in the, in the Constitution, as you mentioned, the uh, Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause. Very general words to resolve very complicated issues. And that's how courts are faced in the constitutional law sense with decision making, taking very general words. The Congress shall make no law respecting an established religion and decide whether that means that tuition tax credits can't be given to parents of children who attend private schools. It's a very difficult cast. case. It must make decisions. It isn't easy to avoid them like politicians can avoid questions. It must make them. It's been very fragmented in the 70s and 80s, and I think I'll try and address that shortly in a moment. The basic points that I think one should keep in mind in looking at establishment clause or free exercise issues that the courts face are two. The basic principle, I think, is very simple. You can boil it all down to saying that the, fork, the focus of the First Amendment and religion is that it encourages, if not mandates, that the government be neutral when it decides questions that affect religion. Neutrality is the name. It is not propounding any particular religion or inhibiting any other religion. So it must be neutral. The second point that I think one has to keep in mind is that it's very easy for the snake, to use the metaphor, for the snake to eat its tail. That is, these two clauses are in some sense opposed to each other and create a very significant tension. And let me demonstrate that. If one takes the position that one should totally wall the government from religion and religion from government, and I don't hear Charles saying that precisely, but that close, it's a close approximation of, of that position. The consequence might be very well to completely disestablish religion or not make establishment cases, but at the same time it might inhibit the free exercise of religion. So one has to be careful in establishing a separatist position. For example, let us suppose we have a zoning law that totally excludes all churches from a municipality. In that case, clearly there would be a wall of separation between church and state, but one might very well argue that the consequence on the other side is to inhibit the free exercise of religion for all the inhabitants of the town. So that th on that side you have that snake eating its own tail, establishment creating free exercise problems. On the other hand, if you have an establishment type case, let us say that we propound the idea that, church is, that, that there should be a state mandated prayer in church with the court outline outlawed in 1962. That might very well encourage a certain level of free exercise of religion by the adherents of people who bought the idea of that particular prayer in the schools, 
but it clearly would be putting the state behind religion. So again, you have free exercise, if it's pushed too far, and encouragement of free exercise, establishmentarian problems. So that are the two basic problems I think one must be aware of. And then I think if you want to get more detailed on it, you look at how the court decides particular cases. And briefly, it's a question of balancing. And I don't mean to overstate the proposition, because it's a little more complicated than that. But on the free exercise, the court's exercise side, the court says, what's the burden on religion by a particular act of the government against what's the state's interest in performing that act? And I think a very good case to illustrate the point is the compulsory vaccination laws. Before your child can go to school, you must have a certain number of shots. But my religion is inhibited because I don't believe that my children should have shots. I don't think that God intended that they be stuck with needles, whatever. How do you decide that case? Well, you balance the individual inhibition against the state's interest. And in that case, the court, by the way, said that the state wins. On the establishment side, if you look at involvement by the government in religious affairs, which is what establishment talks about, what one asks is, to justify that involvement is, is there some worldly reason, the court uses the term secular, I like the word worldly, for involving the state in religious affairs? If there is, is that the dominant reason for engaging in the activity? If it is, as long as there isn't any entanglement by the state, then it's okay. So, a long time ago the court said, busing children in the different context than we currently worry about busing to parochial schools is all right, because there's a secular purpose. On the other hand, providing certain textbooks might not be a purely secular purpose. It might have religious purposes. The most recent case, of course, is the one that you mentioned dealing with nativity scenes. The court actually says that the involvement by the state in that case, by sponsoring the nativity scene, has secular purposes. I might say, by, as an aside, that as one who has some a Christian heritage, that, that kind of disturbs me to say that a nativity scene is nothing more than another commercial exploitation. But the point is that that's what the court, how the court works it through. What's the purpose for involvement? Is it a good, is it a neutral purpose in the sense that there's a worldly or secular reason for it? And can the government avoid entangling itself in the religious activities? If so, then it's not an establishment problem. Now, that's a complicated issue and it, it gets addressed in a lot of different areas. What we see happening, and I'm just about finished here, what we see happening, I think, on the establishment side is a movement by the court toward more accommodation of religion. That's the, that's the signs that are in the wind, as far as I can tell. If you talk about the nativity scene case, if you talk about the tuition uh, tax credit case in Minnesota a couple of years ago, and if you talk about uh, the case dealing with chaplains in state legislatures in Nebraska, all of those are an indication of more accommodation and less concern with rigid anti-establishmentarian positions. Not totally the case, because there are some counter trends as well, particularly the case that said that a city cannot give the power to churches to decide zoning issues surrounding their uh, particular establishments. The last point I'd like to make, uh, the future, in other words, is looking toward probably more relaxation of the wall, if anything. Uh, one other point I'd like to make that I think we overlook, and as a lawyer I can't help but say this, and that is that, that one should be careful in, in looking at what the court does to realize the enormous complexity of this issue and the number of different occasions in which the court has to decide the case before one is too critical. Uh, on the free exercise side, let's quickly run some down. Polygamy, solicitation by churches, the closed Sunday closing laws, unemployment compensation for Seventh-day Adventists. Those are just a few of the issues. What a religion is, who gets to decide that question? On the establishment side, aid to schools, elementary schools, high schools, colleges, universities, prayer in schools, posting of the Ten Commandments on the walls, curriculum controls, uh, nativity scenes, chaplains in legislatures, ecclesiastical disputes. If you have an argument about who gets the property between a dissident s part of the sect and the major part of the uh, ownership, who gets to decide it? The court has to face those issues. In doing that, it has to decide these social policy questions with very little guidance from the First Amendment, and that means that it has to do a lot of pragmatic decision making. Gentlemen, with what you said, we've thrown so much out on the table. I'm sorry we only have 20 minutes left. I know we could go for several days. Uh, but I would like to throw out two or three things, and then we'll have a roundtable discussion, and would really appreciate all your comments. 
it seems from the presentation that we have here today and uh, also other things that have happened in this process that there's so much room for disagreement, but as it's been indicated, uh, there's conflicts that are going to rise between individuals because we're going to deal with the uh, policies that affect people. There's two or three things I'd like to put on the table and then get your reaction. First of all is the question of the conservative uh, uh, approach to theology, and then, as Reverend Hermstead has labeled a, what he consul calls the progressive approach, the, the two are both involved but in a very different way. It's often asked of uh, those who are participating in the process, what is the basic difference? If I have interpreted correctly from the more conservative approach, uh, the issue seems to be issues uh, as abortion or voluntary prayer in schools or some type of prayer in schools, and the question of some amendments to the Constitution to mandate those particular positions. From the progressive wing, uh, there tends to be emphasis on civil rights or on the issues of foreign policy and peace issues. Are the people from these two viewpoints uh, both involved in the political process but have emphasizing different issues, or is there a fundamental difference in these two approaches as it relates to the church-state uh, uh, issue? Another thing I'd like to throw on the table uh, for some consideration in addition to that question has to do with something we have not addressed here today yet, and that is those people in society, such as the United States, where we are a pluralistic society, who are not religious at all and have no affiliation with any organized religion, where do they fit into the process, particularly if it comes to the point of making public policy from a religious viewpoint? Where do they fit in? What uh, do we do to consider their views and their actions for behavior in, in life? Uh, I think these are some things that, uh, that we should address. Uh, I might also ask you to consider, in relation to all of that, uh, when the conflicts arise and if the country is very divided on it, uh, and yet certain segments of society or the court even feel that we should go in a certain direction. How do we protect the rights of those who choose not to take that path? And I've thrown a lot at once, and I would like for you to react to this and other things that have been commented on today. Um, Dr. Glock, maybe we'll start with you again and let you react to uh, some of those points. Well, on the first one, having to do with the conservative and progressive, uh, <coughs> I think this illustrates the danger of religion trying to gain too much power in promoting its point of view because one, religious people tend to be strong believers in what they believe in and they are not likely to be open to the idea that the position that they adopt is not a Christian one. Yet we know from the conflict that's going on that there are two Christian positions on almost every issue. If you look at data from church members, you will find consistently that they disagree more than they agree. On the issue of abortion, for example, uh, you find that there are more Christians in America who would favor some openness on the abortion issue than to take a closed position. So that in this respect, I still feel strongly, and this would tie in with the other point, that that irreligious people and religious people have avenues to have their, their uh, voices heard, and that they do that through organizations of persons of like mind. The problem is that the church tries to organize people of different minds and to speak for it. So if it let church people go out and organize movements that would try to foster their own positions, there are a lot of religious people in the wilderness society, for example, and I presume there must be some very religious ones, although there aren't too many in America. Uh, I was trying to say, and I'll make that point now, I was trying to say that I admire Reverend Falwell in setting up his political organization separately from his church. The moral majority is a separate organization from the church that he operates in Virginia. Uh, the problem, however, is with it, I feel, is that he then tries to act as if he has exclusive right on a Christian position. At least that is the message that tends to come through. And it's in that respect that I think the Christian people, Jewish people, irreligious people have their best way to get into politics by acting as individuals and through forming organizations of like-minded people and not claiming that they represent 
all religious people. Dr. Glock, and this is not a problem that's confined to religion, it's right. all organizations, but how, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, the church itself shouldn't take positions, but religious members should. If you're a very well-known religious leader of whatever uh, group, and you take a public position, how do you separate your role in religion and, and heading the organization from your active participation? I know it's a, a difficult process. Can it be done? I think some, some people do it very effectively. Uh, again, there's no doubt that Ra Reverend King is a good example of a religious leader who somehow tried to represent his faith in his political positions. But he also set up a separate organization to, to foster his political beliefs. And he was anxious. He didn't want just Baptists in that movement. He wanted people who shared his, his positions on civil rights. And it seems to me there were many Baptists, I'm sure, who did not share his position on civil rights. But I, he would be an example, it seems to me, of someone who acted as an individual organized groups that would represent his points of view, asked others who take his <coughs> point of view to share it, and did not insist that this was the position of Baptists in the United States. Reverend Green and, and, and Reverend Hermstead, I sure. would like to get your reaction to in particular, since you both do advocate uh, very much involvement, but uh, I am trying to indicate the different issues. How do you look at this? Is there any difference, or uh, how does that relate to what other people believe and whether they might agree or disagree? I think a uh, basic comment that re really relates to what Dr. Glock is saying regarding uh, the participa participation in society. Generally speaking, I think uh, what, we, what we traditionally call the conservative position has to do with, with primarily individual personal um, concerns, uh, morality as it affects individuals, as it, as it affects students in school. Um, I think generally the progressive or the liberal, however you want to name that, tends to look rather at a, at a view of society as uh, insisting that life is corporate and that our life is indeed shaped with and by others so that we live in, uh, in a corporate society. Uh, we live as persons who are given identity by the societies to which we belong. Um, we are not we are not individuals in isolation from the groups to which we belong and, and the faith which we hold. So uh, the progressive view simply uh, tries to carry that out uh, and say on, on the whole our concern is not so much for our own benefit, uh, although we have that concern also, but, but the concern is for what we understand the, uh, the scriptures to be speaking in my own tradition to the society at large and indeed to the to the community of the earth at large. Um, I think that that is often separate from partisan politics, although certainly uh, you can't deal with the world without getting involved with partisan kinds of politics. I think the church is in error when it takes a particular view, whether it be Republican or Democratic, um, and, and decides to deal with uh, you know, we are God's people and we are right and if you disagree, um, we don't vote for them because they're not Christian. Uh, but I think it basically boils down to how you view scripture. Does it speak to you only as an individual? Is it only your individual relationship with God that's at stake? Or is it a matter of how you live in the world at large? And I, I think that's basically where the difference But wouldn't you say about? that the conservatives on abortion are saying this is the way we th should live? Oh, sure, sure, but that it's, a, it's a matter of personal morality, I think, that they're concerned about. They, they wish to insist that personal morality requires that abortion not happen. Reverend Green, I'd like to get you to respond to this, uh, the same issue of whether or not, are there some issues that are private and individuals should make their own decision, and are there other issues that do affect uh, globally all people, and therefore that it's more appropriate, or is that not correct uh, to get involved in those? I, I believe that's what Reverend Hermstead is saying. True. I think that uh, everybody is trying to head down the same road but get there a different way. And if I hear the issues of whatever it is, church and state separation and abortion and prayer in school, that uh, mankind is, is seeking to be happy, for one, and one is saying, well, we can be happy if you let us pray and uh, we'll be happy if you, uh, you know, legislate uh, 
non-prayer in the schools. But ultimately, whichever uh, channel the individual takes to go down the road for happiness, I would say conservatively that uh, the legislation has already been taken care of. And God has already legislated his laws into humanity. Now whether we pass them through the legislature or not, the law does not negate. For instance, if we had a law of uh, the speed limit that was on the books for the state of Idaho and, and it said that you uh, should go 55 mile, miles an hour around this turn and otherwise you'll, uh, chances are, go off the road. That uh, that's good and we have the choice there to, to a either go 55 or not. But even if the law wasn't on the books of Idaho, let's say, and we chose to go around the curve at 90 miles an hour, we'll find that the law still applies to us. I just say that to say that God has already set laws into motion that regardless of what we do through the legislature, uh, through abortion, for instance, whether it's on the books or not, from experience of talking with, with women on the issue of abortion, that, that there, there's things that they're paying the penalty in a sense of, of the guilt and the things that come from the higher law of God. And I'm not sure what the answer specifically here is to the question uh, of conservative uh, viewpoints and progressive viewpoints, but I would say that it would do all of us good to realize that the laws are going to, to take place. We're living a, a law just by breathing. God's law is, is very absolute in our society, and we have the choice to, to follow it or... or uh, turn away from it. Professor, yes, Reverend. I'd like to, to wonder, if one of the things that's disturbed me about what's, uh, what's normally called the, that moral majority position is that we, uh, we take abortion as a serious issue and uh, we want to make sure that abortion is at least difficult to, to obtain and uh, that under certain circumstances where the mother's life is at risk or something like that. But, uh, but the same group in relation, for example, to the nuclear question is willing to advocate uh, nuclear holocaust for the sake of defending the nation, in which case, um, you know, life may be sacred before birth, but it's not particularly sacred after birth. At least that's a question that, that I find myself wondering about. Uh, are we willing, because of, um, of a particular political persuasion, to, uh, to not face the question of the morality of nuclear policy when we are willing, uh, because of our own convictions, to face the question of individual morality relative to, to uh, abortion. That's a question I struggle with, anyway. Professor Mache, I saw from what you said here something that uh, maybe gets a, a, a debate going. You indicated that the court has the responsibility, if I interpret it correctly, under the Constitution to make sure the state stays neutral. I've also heard other comments today that there is the law of God and that that law, whether implemented at the present time or not, is what we are to do. I guess my question to you would be, uh, how do you deal with these different concepts? Uh, can the state remain neutral uh, and at the same time uh, implement certain uh, Christian principles? And I guess I have another aspect of that, and that is we have grown to be even more pluralistic and we have, uh, in addition to the Christian religion, a number of other uh, organized religions in this country that has a rather large membership and perceives it different. How do we deal with the, the non-religious community, uh, the Christian community, and other organized religion, and this role of neutrality? Well, I think that that's <coughs> a problem that, that we haven't addressed very adequately in our discussion so far is that when one speaks of religion and politics, one in this country tends to think of the Christian perspective, and certainly there are many others that one, that, that one can deal with. How can the state be neutral and at the same time respect moral judgments? I suppose that's the question, yes. isn't it? That's the process of transformation of a, what is a religious, what can be identified with a religious position into public policy how one goes about that is through, I think, through the process of pluralistic debate uh, and that what I see as a difficulty in explicitly identifying a question as a religious question as opposed to a question of public policy and morality 
is that you cloud the debate. And I think that there are common grounds upon which we can debate the issues uh, which don't lend themselves necessarily to theological interpretations, or if they do, they can be generalized into other positions uh, of a moral nature. However, I, I'm begging the question to some extent because I think that the very focus of the issue, the distinction between law and morality, is one that has baffled and mystified uh, jurisprudence and other philosophers for a great, great number of years, and I struggle with it all the time. I don't have any problem with it telling my Sunday school class one thing and dealing on that level, and dealing personally, then dealing on the other level uh, w with students who are looking at the law. But uh, the intersection between the two, morality and law, is a difficult one. And one comment that, that it seems to me that, that we ought to maybe think about is to the extent that we explicitly identify religious and dogmatic positions in religion in the political sphere, there is in some sense, to me at least, as a personal reaction, a kind of trivializing of the religious nature of the debate that we're asking the state to get behind our religious conviction and principle. And that in itself, it seems, is somewhat destructive of the, of the nature of the religious belief, whether it's a corporate or individual process. I guess, Dr. Gluck, I would uh, direct this to you. If we're going to legislate extensively in the question of religious and moral issues, where do we reach the point that we have problems with other parts of the Constitution or in a democratic society? When do we reach the point that we are mandating a, a given behavior and we not leave any choices to the individual. Is, do you see that as a problem? Well, I think that is what the society is uh, sort of based on, the idea that one gives men as much freedom as we can allow and maintain the society. Uh, societies are good when most things, when the law doesn't have to cover too many things, when there's consensus and agreement about how things should work. It's only when things get difficult and there's, that we begin to say, well, we must put that in law because this is such a valued thing to the society that we cannot tolerate dissent. I'm, I'm so and sorry I would not to like to have an extension of that. Sorry. Gentlemen, I know I, it's no surprise to say to you and to the audience that we have not resolved this issue this evening. And uh, I'm sure that it will go on for many more years. Uh, but I do appreciate your time, and you've been most kind with your time, and uh, you've been very informative. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the special production that we have done uh, on the issue of religion and the state, or religion and politics, on the horn of a dilemma. I would like to point out as we close out this program uh, that this issue is of great importance to this country, and maybe we could conclude with the statement that since we are a pluralistic society, and since we have different viewpoints on this panel, we have different religions, and different other positions in our society that in that itself may be our greatest uh, protection as we move forward in a democratic society debating it. I hope you've enjoyed our program and that you'll be with us again on our next viewing. Please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.